<laughs> well, that was a flash. <laughs> My goodness. Is that a Polaroid? It is. Whoa. Taking us back. Okay. I think, is the mic okay? Yes. Yeah? Okay. All right, everybody. Happy Monday and good afternoon to everyone. Hope everyone got some rest after last night's Super Bowl. Uh, the president was able to catch some of the game, and on his behalf, I want to extend a big congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs on their third Super Bowl win in just five seasons, and also congratulations to all the Swifties out there. The president looks forward to welcoming them back once again to the White House to celebrate their latest victory. As you know, it is a White House tradition. Uh, and so without ado, don't have anything much more. I know you, I know you guys are excited about that. Uh, we have our, uh, the Admiral here, our, my colleague, John Kirby, who is here to discuss the visit of uh, King Abdullah of Jordan and the latest on the Israeli hostages who were freed in Rafah and also the Libido Corridor Private Sector Investment Forum. Admiral? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you know, the President is uh, hosting King Abdullah here at the White House this afternoon. It's the 75th year of diplomatic relations between Jordan and the United States, and this meeting will help further strengthen uh, our enduring bilateral relationship. Uh, during the meeting, President Biden and the King will discuss the ongoing situation in Gaza, of course, in efforts to help produce an enduring end to this conflict. We'll also discuss increasing humanitarian assistance into Gaza and a vision for a durable peace uh, to include uh, the viability of a two-state solution with Israel's security guaranteed. Now, before we get into questions, I just want to express how pleased we are to hear the news of two Israeli hostages freed last night by Israeli Defense Forces in, in Rafah. After 128 days, Fernando Simon Marion and Louis Har are now reunited with their families where they belong. That's where all the hostages belong, quite frankly. And so President Biden and his entire team is going to continue to work around the clock to ensure and to secure their release. We will spare no effort to do so. And that includes capitalizing on recent progress in negotiations with our counterparts in the region, and those negotiations are ongoing. Uh, now, I've also seen reports that civilians were killed over the weekend in Rafah due to Israeli operations. I can't confirm those reports, but as we have said many times, the proper number of civilian casualties is zero. We don't want to see a single innocent civilian death, Israeli or Palestinian. But let me be clear, there can be no enduring end to this crisis until Hamas releases the men and women that they are holding hostage, all of them. Their release and a prolonged humanitarian pause is also essential for bringing critical relief to in the innocent people of Gaza who have absolutely nothing to do with the underlying conflict. And this remains our paramount objective. Now, as uh, Kareem teased, just a real quick note on Africa. Last Thursday, the United States, the government of Zam Zambia, and the Africa Finance Corporation convened the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment Libido Corridor Private Sector Investor Forum. I tried to say that 10 times uh, in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, this was the first PGI Investor Forum held outside of the United States, bringing together more than 250 business and government leaders. With over a billion dollars in U.S. and G7 financing, the corridor will ultimately connect Africans from Western Angola to Tanzania and the Indian Ocean through rural bridges, upgraded 4G and 5G digital connect connectivity, uh, increases in solar power, investing in agribusiness and food security, uh, and the biggest rail investment in Africa in U.S. history. So very exciting. We're, we're, we're very, very pleased to be able to move this forward, this, this development project. Um, and, uh, and it's exciting, and we'll keep you posted. With that, we'll take some questions. Thank you, John. First off, congratulations, uh, Art Order, I believe. Um, the President, uh, yesterday's conversation with Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu reiterated the U.S. opposition to uh, uh, operation, expanded operations inside Rafa uh, to, to root out Hamas's remaining battalions there. Um, in your uh, outline a few, a few seconds ago about what the end stage Hamas has released, the remaining hostages to end the conflict, uh, does the U.S. believe that Hamas can remain in Rafa? Uh, is that an acceptable end game of, you know, how are the Israelis, if they can't go into Rafa to remove Hamas, how are they supposed to get rid of uh, Hamas from Gaza, which the U.S. has said is their end goal here? 
Oh, we never said that they can't go into Rafah to remove Hamas. Hamas remains a viable threat to the Israeli people, and the Israelis and the IDF absolutely are going to continue operations against their leadership and their infrastructure, as they should. We don't want to see another October 7th. What we said is that we don't believe that it's advisable to go in in a major way in Rafah without a proper, ex executable, effective, incredible plan um, for the safety of the more than a million Palestinians that are taking refuge in Rafah. They, they've left the north, and they certainly went south out of Khan Yunus to try to get out of the fighting. So Israel has an obligation to make sure that they can protect them. And uh, it, related to the ceasefire uh, uh, hostage deal talks, uh, yesterday a senior, senior administration official says that a framework uh, was, was nearly reached, but there were gaps remaining. I was hoping you can provide some clarification on what the remaining gaps are and where, on which side of the uh, conflict those gaps uh, are. I, I'm sure you can understand. I'm not going to get into the, the details of the negotiations. We do believe, as I've said before, that there has been constructive progress towards trying to get a deal in place for an extended pause and getting all the hostages out. But it's, it's not done, and nothing is really negotiated until everything is negotiated. And those conversations are ongoing now, and it would be really irresponsible for me to, to get into the details of it. And just lastly for me, um, <coughs> it, it, you had said the U.S. response to the killing of the three American uh, service members in, in Jordan would be fa it phased over, over some time, a few days. Uh, is it safe to, to say that the, that the U.S. response at this point is concluded, or is it still ongoing? You have to wait and see. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, Secretary Austin is back in the hospital. Uh, we wish him well, but he's had to cancel uh, a, week, uh, a trip this week to Europe uh, and another gathering of the Ukraine contact group, which he could attend virtually if he wanted to. First off, has the President spoken to Secretary Austin since he was hospitalized? I'm not aware of any conversation between the two of them since, uh, since this just happened yesterday. Does the President have any concerns that with his medical problems the Secretary can no longer serve? Not at all. Um, there were conversations here last week, I know, about the President saying uh, that Israel's moves into southern Gaza have been, quote, over the top, and there were suggestions that that isn't necessarily something new. But that is a slightly more direct commentary on what they may or may not end up doing than we've heard from him in the past. And we normally hear from world leaders talking about what other world leaders are up to. Is he changing his rhetoric on this? given the concerns expressed by members of his party, especially those in Swing State, Michigan? I think the president's been pretty dang consistent, almost from the very beginning, he Ed, about... saying it was over the top of the He's been very consistent, Ed, about uh, our concerns over uh, civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure and the need for the Israeli Defense Forces to act with precision and deliberateness um, and do caution about um, taking innocent life. I mean, that is not a new position by this administration, certainly not a new position by the president. Was that what he expressed yesterday in their call? I want going to get beyond the readout. Uh, we, I think we, we offered you a, a pretty good summary of the things that they discussed. Thanks, Craig. John, uh, over the weekend, satellite imagery emerged that indicates that Venezuelan military assets have been moved along their border with Guyana. Do you have a comment? We've. Uh, We've obviously been monitoring this closely uh, ourselves. Uh, our assessment is that uh, whatever military movements there have been by Venezuela have been of a very uh, of a small nature and, and size and scale and scope. Uh, we see no indication that there's about to be hostilities or that the Venezuelan military would be capable uh, of conducting um, any significant military activities there. Uh, we continue to urge uh, 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 a, a peaceful resolution to this, and obviously we're going to continue to watch it closely. I would remind that anything that we're doing down in, uh, in Guyana or in that area is done fear, purely for defensive purposes. And on uh, on Haiti, the administration is uh, convening a meeting, including the Kenyans. That's right. Uh, starting today, I understand. Starting today days. and tomorrow, yeah. Okay. Um, what What's the goal of that meeting, and when would you like to see this force deploy? Well, we think there's a... a certainly a significant need for a multinational security force of some kind down there to help protect the people of Haiti. You're right, there are discussions going on, started today, will go on uh, again uh, tomorrow over at uh, Fort McNair here in town. Um, so we're, uh, we're glad to host them, um, look forward to uh, seeing where we can get. But the idea really is to start to set out the general parameters of what that multinational security force could look like and how it would operate. Um, it's a Entry-level discussion, I have no doubt that there will be follow-on discussions as appropriate. John, the, on the Jordanian meeting today, the Jordanians previewed the King's visit here as an effort to 
uh, gather support for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Um, the president obviously is, has been a hard no on a ceasefire. Is that going to be the position he presents to the Jordanian king today when they meet? Well, let's let the conversation happen before we get ahead of it. Uh, the, we have been very consistent that uh, we don't support a general ceasefire at this time, which is, you know, uh, uh, again, a ceasefire that would lead to um, both sides laying down arms permanently and, and, and ending the war. Now, we want to see the war end as soon as possible, and we believe uh, one of the first steps that's critical to doing that is a humanitarian pause, an extended pause, that longer than what we saw back in November of a week that would allow us to get all the hostages out, get more aid and assistance in, um, and then hopefully lead to discussions that, that could get us closer to an end to the conflict. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Corinne. Thanks, April. So President Biden had told Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu that any potential ground invasion in Rafah should not happen without a plan to protect civilians there. Is the president confident that this message is getting through to Netanyahu? And where are these civilians supposed to go? So much of the infrastructure has already been destroyed in Gaza. He's confident that the, our Israeli counterparts understand our concerns. Uh, we've made them privately. We've made them publicly. Um, I won't speak for the Israelis or... Uh, or what they may or may not do, uh, but they uh, but they've heard loud and clear our concerns about where the civilians that, that the civilians need to be protected. Uh, I, I can't tell you here, talking Selena, what, what that would look like. Uh, but uh, but we we hope and expect that our Israeli counterparts will factor in the safety of those civilians uh, appropriately as they consider future operations down in Rafa. So what could that look like, given the situation? I, again, I, I can't get ahead of where we are right now. That's really going to be a question for the Israeli Defense Forces. They know and they understand our concerns. And Israel's Prime Minister told ABC News without presenting evidence that Israel's military has killed more Hamas fighters than civilians. What is the U.S. assessment of that? Do you agree with what Netanyahu told us? We don't have an independent assessment of, of those figures. And just lastly, the White, what is the White House reaction to Trump saying he would encourage Russia to attack NATO allies if they don't contribute enough towards defense spending? What is the message that not only sends to the world, but especially to U.S. allies? Well, now, you know, I've got to be careful. I can't talk about things that have been said on the campaign trail. All I can tell you is that under this particular president, President Biden, uh, as commander in chief, NATO is now more relevant, stronger, bigger than it's ever been before. Uh, and uh, he has really prioritized our, our network of alliances and partnerships around the world. And, of course, NATO is right at the forefront of that uh, when it comes to the security environment uh, on the continent of, of Europe. Um, and that's what, that's what the American president ought to be about, be about reinforcing alliances and partnerships and sending a strong signal, particularly to NATO allies, about how seriously we take our Article 5 commitments. And you've heard from President Biden, gosh, I don't know how many times. We will defend, if needed, every inch of NATO territory. That's what the Commander-in-Chief of the United States ought to be saying when it comes to NATO. And just to follow up on that quickly, um, Vice President Harris is going to be in Munich with a lot of those European uh, security leaders. Is part of her duty there to reassure the allies that that uh, deterrence is, is still a, a, a force here? I have no doubt that the Vice President will take the opportunity while she's in Munich not only to talk about our uh, how this administration is pursuing our national security interests in Europe and beyond, but how important, again, uh, we consider uh, our network of alliances and, and partnerships. And, and Trevor, there's no other nation in the world, none, that has a network like the United States has because the president and the vice president and the national security team has invested so much energy in the last three years in revitalizing them. A lot of allies and partners had a lot of questions when we came into office because they didn't feel valued. They didn't feel respected. They didn't feel like the United States uh, was, uh, was willing to continue to lead on, on, the, on the world stage. And, and we've proven that we are. On Rafa, does the has the president ever threatened to strip military assistance from Israel if they move ahead with a Rafa operation that does not take into consequence uh, what happens with civilians? We're going to continue to support Israel. They have a right to defend themselves against Hamas, and we're going to continue to make sure they have the tools and the capabilities to do that. And what's the view about the role that Egypt should play there? Do they need to reopen their? Do they need to open that border on their side in order to allow civilians to come through? Uh, they, Egypt has been a terrific counterpart with respect to Rafa uh, and um, and the use of that gate and allowing people that need to get out to get out uh, people that you know third third country nationals and, and uh, they continue to do that they've been a terrific partner. But it is closed, right? So the average person can't. There will be so. there have been and I suspect there will be closures at times uh, based on the security environment. But um, 
but we're not concerned about our ability to continue to communicate with President El Sisi about um, about the the proper use of that gate. But just to be clear, people are actually penned in right now, Gaza civilians who are not able to egress, right? You're talking about Egypt, Palestinians. Palestinians yeah, I mean, who are not able to egress. So is that something that the president wants to see movement on? We don't want to see any forced relocation of people out of Gaza. The, that's home for the Palestinian what people. Well, again, that's something that we, we, we have and will continue to discuss with counterparts in the region, but, but it's home to those folks. That's Gaza's home. Um, and they shouldn't be forced to leave Gaza if they don't want to leave. Now, if there's going to be operations in Rafah or around Rafah, the Israelis have a commitment, an obligation to make sure uh, that they can provide for the safety of innocent Palestinian, the innocent, innocent pal Palestinian people that are there. But you're not pressuring Egypt to allow them. I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of diplomatic conversations that we're having. Uh, we won't, don't want to see any Palestinian people forced out of Gaza. That, that's their home. Um, if there are people that, that need to leave, that are not Palestinians and want to leave, obviously we're working with Egypt to do that. Good. Thanks, Admiral. Um, can you just talk to us about the feasibility of moving the entire civilian population out of Rafa? Is that even physically doable? There's a lot of folks there, uh, MJ, more than a million. Some estimates have it almost at 1.5 million. Um, that's a lot of people that move down to Rafa to get out of the fighting. And so again, um, the the, the task of providing for their safety at that number and in such confined spaces is difficult. There's no question about it. That's going to be a heavy lift. For any military, it would be a heavy lift. Uh, but, uh, but that's the conversation that we want to keep having with our Israeli counterparts. That some, that, that, I don't know what it's going to look like. We can't tell you what it's going to look like. That's really for the IDF to speak to. But it absolutely has to be accounted for think it's a it is a realistic goal that it is viable to try to move those people out of that area well, let's see what the israeli defense forces come up with and if they go ahead with the ground incursion anyway before the civilian population can safely be moved out of that area would there be any consequences from the u.s i know trevor just asked a question about you know potentially stripping you know military support or security assistance what would the consequence be for israel if they went ahead and did that anyway. I don't want to get into hypotheticals on that. We've, we've been very clear with our Israeli counterparts privately and publicly about what our expectations are for the treatment of the innocent people uh, that, are, that are down there near Rafa. Um, and we're going to continue, to, as I mentioned to Trevor, we're going to continue to support Israel. They have a right and responsibility to go after Hamas. We're going to make sure that they can continue to do that. But as from the very beginning, we want to make sure that they do that in a way that fully accounts for the preservation of innocent life and civilian infrastructure. And just since the president is about to meet with a close ally that publicly supports a ceasefire in Gaza, can you just talk to us about whether the president's thinking on that has evolved at all? You know, is he a little bit closer to potentially supporting that publicly than, say, a month ago? Has his thinking on that evolved at all? We haven't changed uh, in, in terms of our desire to see an extended pause. Uh, so that we can get all the hostages home with their families where they belong, so we can get additional security assistance in, and we can see a reduction in the violence. We are still focused on trying to get an extended humanitarian pause. I'm asking about a permanent pause. I know what you're asking. We're, what I'm saying is we support and continue to support an extended humanitarian pause. Uh, thanks, John. I, you talk, uh, I know you can't give uh, specifics about consequences, but I mean, would the United States policy change under any circumstances? You, know, you talk about an obligation to protect civilians. The president has talked about over-the-top indiscriminate bombings. Is there anything, would there be any consequences? Would the U.S. policy change, or is it support no matter what? I just won't get ahead of where we are right now, and I'm certainly not going to engage hypotheticals. We want to make sure Israel can continue to defend itself. We want to make sure that humanitarian assistance continues to flow to the people of Gaza, and by no means has there been enough. There needs to be more. And we want to get all those hostages home. We believe that the best way to accomplish those three goals is to get an extended pause in place, to bring the violence down, to get people out and get aid in. And that's what we're focused on. And I, I, get, the, I get the thrust of the question. I'm just not going to engage in hypotheticals about changes in policy. concern that you can give to the Israelis to, to help protect the civilians? We have communicated, uh, again, consistently and stridently since the beginning of the conflict. I mean, since the time the president went to Tel Aviv on the 17th of October, just a week or so after the attacks, uh, how important it is that Israel knows it's going to have our support and 
that they do everything they can to protect innocent life. On, an, on another question, if I may, what, what does, what, why did the president allow his campaign, the president, uh, allow his campaign to go on TikTok despite the national uh, security review of the platform? I'd have to refer you to the campaign. For but that. I mean, it's still the president of the United States. He's still sending, the president is sending a message to Americans about the Nash, about the safety of TikTok by doing that. I'd have to refer you to the campaign on that decision. Thanks, Queen. Thanks, Admiral. Um, sorry to press you on this issue of, um, of Rafa, but I mean, and you say there's, you know, we're not going to talk about um, possible halting military aid. You're not going to talk about consequences. What leverage does the White House actually have uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that Israel does not launch uh, a military offensive in uh, in Rafa, uh, you know, without taking the necessary steps? Well, I don't think you're all that sorry about pressing me on this, but I'll I'll, I'll go ahead. And, uh, that's okay. It's all right. Um, <laughs> uh, I, look, it's not about leverage. Uh, it, it's about being consistent. And, and I've said it before just in the last few minutes. It's about being consistent about our desire to make sure Israel can defend itself so that October 7th can't happen again, which Hamas obviously wants to do. And it's being consistent about the, the, the how they conduct those operations matter. And we have been consistent since the very beginning in talking to the Israelis about about the how, uh, about operations and how they're conducted. And I would tell you um, that throughout this conflict, there have been moments, and there continue to be moments, where we have the opportunity and have taken the opportunity to shape their thinking and to help influence the way they have conducted some of these operations. And that remains today. Thank you. Hi, John. Um, you referenced the release of two hostages, but also there is reports that in the process of this special operation, three hostages were killed, along with 100 Palestinians, including women and children. Also, Egypt threatened to withdraw from the Camp David Agreement if Israel invaded Rafah. So how does the White House navigate this rather complex uh, picture? Yeah, I, I tried to address that in my opening statement, Nadia. Uh, we don't want to see any civilians killed one, at any time, Israel, Israeli or, or Palestinian, in the conduct of operations. Um, the, the right number is, is zero. And so while we're very glad that two hostages are now back with their families where they belong, we certainly mourn any loss of innocent life uh, as a result of those operations. And it just, it just underscores, I think, a couple of things. One, and again, we're not, I can't validate the numbers. I, I've seen the reports, but I can't confirm them. But it does underscore two things. One, the difficulty of conducting military operations in such a closed-in urban environment where there are so many people, and as we talked about earlier, even more people now in the South and Rafa than there were before. So that, that's an added difficulty for the IDF. And number two, it underscores the obligation that they have and that they know they have. Uh, to be careful and discriminant and uh, and very deliberate in how they and how they go after targets. Uh, last thing on this, though, and I think it's an important point, and you didn't ask this, but it's an, uh, we we do know that Hamas uh, leadership and uh, and fighters migrated south. They got pressured in the north, so they went down to Khan Yunus. Of course, they were already in Khan Yunus, but they kind of congregated there. Um, and then, as the Israelis put pressure on them in Khan Yunus. They gravitated further south now towards Rafa. They, by their very presence and their operations down there, they are further endangering uh, the people uh, of, uh, of Gaza that are now settled or trying to f find um, uh, refuge down there uh, in, in Rafa. So there, is, there, is, um, there are legitimate military targets that the Israelis are going to want to go after in Rafa. Again, we just urge them, as we have, to be careful. I also want to ask you the President comments. He referenced over the top and he also said that Israel indiscriminately killing people in Gaza. Yet he's willing to sign off on almost $14 billion in military aid. So how can you reconcile the fact that he's worried about civilian casualties without any serious review about how U.S. weapons are used in a civilian area? Well, I think you know, we uh, uh, just last week, um, late in the week, uh, we issued a national security memorandum that, um, that codifies existing policies and adds reporting requirements onto those existing policies about our expectations for how military assistance is going to be provided to any foreign actor, and of course that includes Israel. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, just to jump off of Nadia's question, um, you've been explicit that the U.S. does not support uh, an operation in Tarapa without a credible, feasible plan to move and protect civilians. Um, yesterday's operation, as you've also acknowledged, there are reports of civilian casualties. Um, but is 
was the operation yesterday within the grounds of the kind of operation that the U.S. would support in Rafa? I, I can't really speak to the specifics of IDF operations. You know I won't do that. They should speak to the operations that they conduct and, and what that looks like. As I understand that, again, this is rudimentary and early information. This was a specific military raid to rescue hostages um, and not necessarily indicative of some larger operation that they uh, have talked about conducting in Rafah to root out Hamas leaders that have now tried to find refuge among the million or so Palestinians that are there. So just in terms of, you know, what the U.S. would support, is it, is it a question of scale? Is it a question of more targeted operations like this are okay despite possible civilian casualties, whereas a mass operation is not okay, like, just in terms of U.S. support? Well, with the caveat that this is a sovereign nation we're talking about, and they get to decide what military operations they're going to conduct. What we've said is uh, we wouldn't support operations, given the current circumstances, where you have, again, more than a million people there with nowhere to go um, and no plan for some place for them to go so that they can be safe. Um, so we look forward to continuing talking to our Israeli counterparts about what that could look like. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Um, John, on TikTok, can you explain what are the national security concerns that the administration mm -hmm. has about TikTok? As you know, uh, it's not approved for use on uh, government devices, and that remains the, the case uh, today. And I think, uh, um, again, I don't want to get into too much of the uh, uh, of the national security technical reasons behind that, but um, it, it does have to do with concerns about the preservation of data and the potential misuse of that data and privacy information uh, by foreign actors. I think that's as does far as I can go. That it's wise for people to use TikTok. Uh, I, again, that's that's not something that I I'm qualified to say from the National Security Council. All I can tell you is it's it's banned on U.S. government devices, and we follow that guidance. So yesterday was the second anniversary of the uh, Biden Harris administration the uh, in the Pacific strategy. We have a statement from the NSC, but I'm um, just wondering how you see the progress so far. Are you satisfied with the progress? I think we've made a lot of progress. I mean, we've initiated AUKUS, and that process is moving along on schedule to get uh, Australia uh, nuclear-powered submarine capability. We've elevated the Quad, the Indo-Pacific Quad. We've upgraded our relationships with Vietnam, with Indonesia, and with ASEAN. Um, and of course, as you know, the president hosted uh, the leaders of Japan and South Korea at Camp David and really got not only significant developments in terms of our bilateral relationship with each country, each ally, but improved opportunities to, to get uh, trilateral cooperation uh, in a much better place than it's ever been. I could go on and on, including adding capabilities in and around the Korean Peninsula to, to keep a better eye on what Kim Jong-un is doing. Um, and, and of course, uh, bolstering all the rest of our alliances and network uh, and power partnerships in the region. Does the U.S. believe that all of the remaining hostages are being held in Rafa? And if so, given that that would include Americans, are there requests by U.S. officials to the Israelis for any assurances for protection of those hostages? We, we sadly don't have a whole lot of specific information about where each of the hostages are who's holding them, and in what condition they might be. And sadly, we have to accept the possibility that some of them are, are no longer alive. We just don't have uh, terrific granularity on, on that. We are in constant conversations with our Israeli counterparts about what they know. Certainly, we're in, we re remain in touch with the families of the American hostages. I think Jake Sullivan just met with them a week or so ago. We'll, we'll maintain constant touch with them and, and try to get as much information as we can. But obviously, the whole reason we're trying to get this deal in place is so that you can provide for the safe and secure passage of hostages out. Yes, it's true, and we're glad that two hostages were rescued, but the, the, but the by, and f by, by and large, uh, the, the, the greatest number of hostages safely released were done through a hostage deal, right? A pause in the fighting where they were able to go, and that's why we're putting so much effort into these current negotiations. We believe that's the best way to get hostages in greater numbers out safely. Thank you, John. I have a question about Afghanistan and then one about N Lunar New Year. Um, starting with Afghanistan, um, the UN is holding its second international conference on Afghanistan um, since the Taliban took power back. That's happening next week in Doha. So I just wonder what, what are the administration's expectations from this gathering and do you see this as a move to normalize the Taliban? 
There are no efforts by the United States government uh, to quote unquote normalize, as you put it, or, or to recognize uh, the Taliban uh, officially. We've said uh, we've said it numerous times. Um, if they want to be seen as legitimate rulers, they need to meet all the commitments that they said they would meet and make, um, and they haven't done that. Should be holding this meeting then. I, I will let the Secretary General speak for what the what meetings the UN's holding. Nothing's changed about our policy when it comes to, uh, to the Taliban. And very quickly, Happy Year of the Dragon. It's a happy year for you, a rabbit. Um, but <laughs> you are a rabbit. You were born in 1963. Yes, you are. I have a follow-up. <laughs> about me being a rabbit? All right. Thank you. I did not know that, but I appreciate that very much. He's a horse. What is the, it's supposed to be a prosperous year for him. What is the president's message for the 20 million Asian Americans who celebrated this this holiday over the weekend? He hasn't issued a message. What is this message? We have actually, I think, put something out on social media uh, about the, the Lunar New Year. And of course, we're wishing everybody who observes the Lunar New Year a, a happy one and a prosperous one, even the even in the rabbits. <laughs> Yeah, yes. uh, Admiral, I wanted to clarify the position on TikTok. So the administration still has concerns, uh, security concerns about TikTok, even though the campaign has now joined it? Uh, again, I cannot speak, nor will I speak for the campaign. For the campaign. I, I can't do that or their decisions. Nothing's changed about the national security concerns uh, from the, the NSC's perspective about the use of TikTok on government devices. That policy is still in place. But surely there must have been some conversation between the White House here and the campaign of whether it was appropriate for the campaign to, to use it. I can't speak to that. Yeah. Uh, Jackie, last one. Thank you, Karine. Um, John, just following up on this TikTok stuff, is, is the CFIUS review still happening? I'd have to refer you to CFIUS. I'm not in a position to confirm one way or another um, what, they're, what they're looking at. So is the administration still weighing a ban on TikTok? Again, I have nothing for you on that, Jackie. I mean, uh, I'd have to refer you to, to CFIUS. All I can speak to credibly, which I have today, is that from an NSC perspective, there are still national security concerns about the use of TikTok on government devices, and there's been no change to our policy not to allow that. Awesome. Can you let me understand, though, like why, why there wouldn't be any communication between CFIUS and the administration broadly, I mean, with the National Security Council? Uh, I, didn't say there, I didn't say there wasn't. I just said I'm not able to speak to uh, issues regarding CFIUS. You'd have to talk to them. It's an independent body, and, and it's not something I, I can't speak I for think them. we're all just trying to square why the I, president would use this platform that his administration is weighing a national ban on because of national security concerns. Again, I'm not going to speak to any hypothetical ban. I can only tell you that it's not allowed on government devices. That policy remains the case, and I just can't speak for the campaign or their decisions. I apologize. Thanks. Thank you so much, Admiral. Thank you. All right. Uh, go ahead, Zeke. It's hey, great. Just a, another round of that TikTok question. Uh, are you aware of any communication between the Biden campaign and anyone who works in the White House about the president uh, joining TikTok? Look, I, I, I can't speak to uh, any conversations on, on specifically on TikTok. Uh, we got to be really careful. The campaign, 2024, can't. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, so we're not going to comment on any specifics. And so certainly we would defer to the campaign on any strategy. The CFIUS process uh, is separate and not going to get ahead of, of what uh, we're going to say here. Um, and I would say that the administration uh, is on record for um, uh, for supporting the Restrict Act, as you all know, uh, something that came up last year. And it's a bipartisan bill, and it is t indeed tailored uh, and risk-based uh, approach so we can protect Americans' freedom of speech, and that's what matters. Uh, as you know, as you know, there are um, uh, folks here who are commissioned uh, officers who certain people are allowed to have conversation uh, with the campaign, but I can't speak to uh, any specific conversations that are happening, ha happening about this particular issue. Again, it's under CFIUS review. We want to be really mindful and not getting ahead of that. And also it's the campaign, so that is something that they would have to have to speak to. And the reason why it is banned on government, uh, government uh, phones or uh, government properties, obviously, devices, is because that is an act of Congress. Uh, that is something that Congress wanted to uh, put forward to make sure that no government uh, government uh, devices uh, are used. 
were you aware uh, before, the, before the campaign posted no. the TikTok? Okay. No, I am, I am very, very careful as the White House press secretary. I have to, I, I'm in a different, uh, kind of in a different box than most. And so I do not communicate with the campaign on any strategy or, or anything like that. Uh, and so uh, I'm just very, very mindful of that. I did not know, I, I knew as, 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 as you all did. A few follow-up from the special counsel's report last week. Um, uh, the, when uh, Ian Sams was here on uh, Friday, uh, he said the White House was considering uh, releasing the transcript of the president's conference, uh, conversa interview with the special counsel, which you all have objected to that characterization of that. Do you have an update on that review process? So look, um, uh, certainly I'm going to refer you to um, the, my colleagues at the White House counsel. I know the president's personal attorney obviously spoke to this uh, on one of the uh, Sunday shows yesterday, uh, so I know they're they're been responsive. Uh, the team here have been responsive to uh, those specific questions. I just don't have anything to share. Um, the, also, uh, the discussion about it, the, pre the president's uh, ordering it, the, the creation of a task force to uh, uh, change policies around uh, the handling of classified information in a, in a presidential transition. Do you have any updates on when the president will create that task force? So I don't have any updates on that particular uh, question about the task force. Um, it, the president's personal di uh, notes from his time as vice president were among those items that were reviewed by the special counsel and, and, the, and the interagency have found to contain classified, in some cases, highly classified information. Um, I, does the president still keep a diary uh, and notebooks now? Look, uh, that particular question, obviously, the White House counsel would be able to speak to more directly, but I do want to remind everyone that this was a 15-month investigation, and I think the outcome of that investigation, obviously, as it's stated, is that uh, counsel, uh, the special counsel has not found any, nothing to prosecute, and I think that's important to note. Uh, and I, anything beyond that, any specific questions about diary or anything like that, I would have to refer you to the White House and counsel. Lastly, uh, when the president hosts the King later, uh, they're going to be making statements why isn't the president, and given all these questions about uh, uh, special counsel and otherwise, why is he taking questions? I mean, look, let, let's be clear. Uh, the day that the special counsel report came out, the president came out in the evening and took uh, and made a statement and took questions. He wanted to make sure that you all heard from him directly. Uh, and so I want to be really, let's not forget that that did occur on the day that the report came out. Uh, look, the president is, is looking forward to welcoming the king, King Abdullah, to the, to the White House. Uh, he comes here every year, as you all know. Uh, uh, during his presidency, and so he looks uh, certainly forward to welcoming the king. So that said, and I said this last week, and I'll just reiterate, there are a variety uh, of factors that go into decision making, that go into uh, uh, press, if there is going to be a press conference or not during foreign uh, foreign leaders. It's, it depends on those, uh, those conversations that we have with the foreign leaders and how that works out. Look, you're going to hear from the president. You're going to hear from the king uh, later, later today, around 4 o'clock. I think that's important. You hear directly from them. Uh, there's just not a press, press conference component to this. Not every trip, uh, not every visit uh, with a foreign leader has a press conference component. Uh, as I stated, King Abdullah has been here almost every year during this president's uh, uh, tenure, and they, that has not been the case. A two plus two has not been the case. I, just, I want to follow up on that real quick yeah. because uh, you mentioned that, uh, that on Friday, yeah. the German Chancellor gave a press conference across the street in Lafayette Park. It seems the White House here at the road. Uh, look, I, that is something for the German Chancellor to speak to as to their government, why they chose to do that. I can't speak to that. Every There, is, there are two, obviously, when... when a uh, foreign leader comes, there are two governments that have this discussion. They go through the process of what they want that trip to look like when they're here at the White House. And there are diff different varying, uh, uh, various factors that play into that. And so every trip is different. Every trip is different. Uh, and with this particular trip, King Abdullah, every time he's been here, there has not been a two plus two. Uh, so that I would remind, uh, remind you all of that as well. Thanks, Kareen. A new ABC News Ipsos poll shows that 86% of Americans think Biden is too old to serve another term. That is a higher percentage than what we found in a previous poll in September. So clearly polling shows this is a persistent issue. What is the White House strategy to try and change that perception? So look, we're going to continue to lead on leadership, right? We're going to continue to focus on what this president has been able to get done, uh, what the president has been able to get done uh, on behalf of the, of the American people. Uh, and look, 
I'll quote a little bit of uh, what the First Lady said, uh, I think incredibly well, just a couple days ago. Uh, the President Biden does more in one hour than most people do in a day. His age with experience and expertise is an incredible asset and he proves it every day. And that's what we believe. We believe that his age and his experience, because he was a senator, because he was obviously the vice president, because he has these long, um, you know, long decades of relationships uh, with leaders, uh, obviously across the globe, and what he's been able to do, that's what we're going to lean into. That's what we're going to speak to. We're going to speak to how he turned the economy back on its uh, feet. We're going to speak to the 14.8 million jobs that he was able to create, how unemployment is at under 4%, how he's, e he's able to uh, beat Big Pharma because Medicare can now negotiate and lower costs for the American people. That's what we're going to focus on, and I think that's the most important thing at this moment, at this time, is delivering for the American people and continuing to do that. And bouncing off of the previous question, the numbers show that President Biden has engaged in about 33 news conferences. Compare that to Obama's 66 and Donald Trump's 52 by this time in their presidencies. Can you explain why the president isn't doing? So look, yeah, and I hear the question, and I know that uh, folks want to hear you all, and it's important because when you all hear from the president, obviously, uh, so does the American people. So we get the importance of that, and we're always going to try to find ways, uh, obviously outside of press conferences as well, uh, to for the president to be out there. And we have found some non-traditional ways. We think it's important to try and meet uh, the American people where they are, uh, and so that is important as well. Whether it's a podcast uh, that's in important, or um, you know, doing 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 certain things that is not the norm. Uh, obviously, the person, uh, the president, I should say, uh, takes, uh, you know, takes your questions uh, when he's on the road as, uh, you know, more often than not, uh, and he finds it important uh, to have those conversations when you all are out there with him on the road taking your questions, and so he does do that. Uh, as far as press conferences, we're going to try and uh, make sure when it's the right time for, to, for those to happen, certainly we will, we will do so. Uh, but it doesn't mean that this president does not engage uh, with, with the press corps, with the White, White House press corps, or uh, with other uh, reporters, uh, journalists out there who have different, uh, different ways with communicating with the American people as well. We think that's important too. Why is it more effective to forego a Super Bowl interview and it, instead? Look, we, we've talked about this. We've talked about this. We've believed that it is an important, uh, obviously, tradition uh, uh, to, to watch the Super Bowl. Uh, and we think there are different ways to communicate with the American people. And we're going to try and find different ways to meet the American people where they are. And, and so that's a, that's a choice that we've made here that we think is actually important and uh, effective. Um, there was some reporting this morning that uh, President Biden told some campaign donors that Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, quote, uh, has been a pain in my ass lately, or, quote, he's been killing me lately. The reason we don't know what the exact quote is is because the press was not in that meeting that the president had with these donors. Why is the president not living up to his full transparency pledge in terms of opening all meetings with donors to the press? So I think that, uh, um, so when the First of all, I want to be careful. These are campaign campaign events, so I just want to be mindful. Can't speak to each of them, or really, most of them. I know that, and as you know, when the president does uh, speak in front of, uh, uh, um, when he does do some of these fundraising events, right? There is uh, when he gives remarks, uh, formal remarks. Uh, the pr the press pool is in there, and they are listening to the remarks uh, and get to uh, get to hear directly what the president says. So I think that's also very important. I don't want to make it sound like uh, he does not. There is not a, a process there that when he is in front of donors giving uh, formal remarks that you all are not in the room as he's speaking. Uh, I can't speak to this particular uh, to this particular um, scenario. Uh, I think that is something certainly uh, he he does have private meetings. That is true. Uh, and when he has those private meetings, those meetings uh, so that there is candor and, and honesty and so that he can hear directly uh, from folks, uh, those tend to be uh, private. But I want to be really careful here uh, in speaking into uh, every, every scenario that happens because I, I can't speak to that particular should, scenario. Should the, should the President of the United States be engaging privately with a random set of financial donors about issues that are of clear public import, like his I mean, opinion of the Israeli No, practice. I hear your question, but the president has private meetings all the time. He does. He has private meetings all the time. 
Uh, and these are foreign leaders, right? These are people who are giving yeah, money to him. Yeah, his campaign. I hear you, but he has private meetings with everyday people. Some of these donors have, uh, and I want to be super mindful here, uh, have concerns, right? As well, just like American everyday American people that he has private meetings with or he sees on the road. Uh, it's not every meeting; it's going to be public. But when he has, when he gives remarks at fundraisers, there is uh, formal remarks. There is uh, the press pool that tends to be in the room or is in the room. Uh, private meetings are different and so that's the way it's been uh, for the you know for, uh, for the past three years on this, this administration look I want to be really careful these are campaign obviously some of them campaign DNC related uh, meetings so I just want to be super super mindful here and what's the distinction between formal and informal remarks look I would honestly I'm going to refer you on anything that's related to these uh, specific meetings I would refer you to the campaign because they're the ones that put it together they're the ones that uh, bring the folks in the room I just want to be super mindful and not go down uh, too far too far rabbit hole here. Okay, MMJ. Hey, Green, um, any updates on when the president's physical might be taking place? So he will have a physical. Uh, when we uh, when we have uh, information on that, so obviously we will uh, certainly share that with all of you. It will be transparent. There will be a, uh, a, a comprehensive uh, report as we have done the last two years. Just don't have a, just don't have a timeline for you. Do you, do you plan on the press getting a heads up before the physical happens or will we find out once it has taken place? Right, we're going to do it the way that we've done it the last two years. It's not going to be anything different. So the way that we've approached this the last two years will be the same way that we do this uh, and, this year, this third does, year. Does the White House think that the, the idea of the president taking a cognition test, a cognitive test, as a part of this uh, physical is a legitimate idea, particularly just on the heels of the special counsel report, more polling, as my colleague Selena just mentioned, showing that many American people have concerns about that. Look, I got this question last week as well, and I'm just going to say what the what uh, Dr. O'Connor, it's kind of a, uh, what he said to me about a year ago uh, when the report came out last year, uh, obviously, on his physical, uh, which is the president proves every day how he operates, how he thinks, right? But by dealing with world leaders, by making really difficult decisions on behalf of the, the American people, whether it's domestic, whether it's national security. And so he shows it every day on how he thinks, how he operates. Uh, and so that is how, uh, that is how the, Dr. O'Connor sees it, and that's how I'm gonna leave it. Uh, taking that kind of a test. I mean, look, uh, and I talked about this last week too on, on I believe, whenever, on Friday. Uh, I have known this president since 2009. Uh, I, he is not just uh, my, my boss, uh, you know, he's also some, a mentor to me. And I spent sometimes countless hours with him, whether it's in the Oval Office, uh, whether it's on the road. And I believe for me, you're asking me my personal opinion, uh, he is sharp. Uh, he is on top of things. He, when we have uh, meetings with him, with his staff, he's constantly pushing us, getting, trying to get more information. And so that has been my experience with this president. Uh, anything else outside of that, uh, I just shared with you what Dr. O'Connor said to me. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Green. No, you're not going to comment on the campaign or its decisions. But does the White House believe that TikTok is giving Americans, especially younger Americans, false perceptions about President Biden and his broader agenda? Look, I'm going to be really careful about speaking to TikTok uh, specifically uh, because there is a CFIUS review. They're in an independent uh, body and they are going to move forward with whatever they decide to do. And so don't want to step into that. Uh, obviously, more broadly, as it relates to social media platforms, we've always said there is misinformation, disinformation out there that we have to try and combat. Uh, and so we've always been very clear. We've always been concerned about our young people uh, and uh, the information that the misinformation, disinformation that they're getting and how that's affecting their lives. That is a concern that we have, and we've talked about that uh, very explicitly, very clearly. Uh, as it relates to TikTok, going to be really careful because of that CFIUS review, and so just want to be super, super mindful. Uh, so uh, obviously just not going to comment on specific cases. Separately, the Senate is on track to pass the National Security Supplemental this week. It's still not clear if Speaker Johnson's going to bring that up for a vote in the House. Does the President plan to have any outreach with House Republican leadership to try to get that across the finish line? So look, you, you know how important uh, the President thinks it is to get uh, that very all-important funding, uh, security assistance to Ukraine, obviously Israel, Indo-Pacific. We've been very clear about that. Obviously, uh, we had this really um, 
uh, careful uh, strategic conversations as well with Senate Republicans and Democrats for the past couple of months for the border security uh, because we we believe that entire package uh, was important but obviously Republicans got Republicans specifically in the House got in the way and would not uh, move that forward and it's unfortunate because that is the way we believe we would have been able to deal with policy issues and funding issues as it relates to the border the challenges at the border and also immigration uh, so look we are in constant communication the team here the office of Ledge Affairs and other White House officials are in constant communication, obviously with the leadership on both sides, uh, on both sides of chamber, um, uh, in each chamber, to try and figure out how we're going to move forward, how we're going to make sure that this all important, uh, all important um, funding uh, gets out there. And so conversations are going to continue. Uh, we are uh, obviously. What we wanted to see is to the border security uh, uh, component, negotiation piece of that to be included. Uh, but we are where we are, and we but we believe it's important. It's important to move forward. But would the president get directly involved in those conversations? I don't have any conversations to read out. Obviously, he tends to have private conversations. We don't read out every conversation. He has relationships with folks in Congress. Uh, but his office of his office of Ledge Affairs and other White House officials are in regular touch uh, with congressional leadership and keeps. They also keep the president uh, updated as well, which is important. Okay. Uh, thanks. Just two things. Um, the first, on the guidance we got for the week, uh, the Republic events for the President today and on Friday, I was hoping you might be able to give us a sense on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, as you make the case that the yeah. President has a lot of vigor and is doing a lot of things. <laughs> what, what, what is, what so let me just talk about Friday a little bit because I think people, I know that uh, an advisory went out uh, on um, over the weekend about East Palestine. All, all, all of you know that he's going to be going to East Palestine on Friday. Uh, he's going to be traveling there. Uh, and it's because of the invitation that he received uh, uh, from the mayor. So it's going to be really important. And while, while the president's on the ground, he'll, he'll get a briefing on the ongoing response and speak to the administration's uh, work to, uh, to uh, keep Norfolk Suffolk accountable, which is incredibly important, and support the community as it moves forward. Uh, he also has heard uh, loud and clear from uh, the folks in East Palestine that they don't want to be de defined by an event. And so he'll, he'll speak to the administration's work to deliver uh, on the needs for family businesses that are affected. And let's not forget there is the Bipartisan Railway uh, Safety Act that he's going to continue to call on Congress to, to move forward on. So that is going to be a really important trip. Uh, you are correct uh, about that. Uh, the president will be out there uh, meeting directly for the, with the American people. I don't have any, um, anything yet for tomorrow, Wednesday, um, or, or Thursday, uh, obviously, when when things move or we have something to share, we'll certainly put that uh, put it, put that out there on the daily guidance. Uh, and uh, obviously, there's some movement happening in Congress as well that we're keeping a close eye on. And so, once we have more to share, we'll have more to share on that. And then, secondly, you you started the briefing by wishing a congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs as as well as to all the Swifties out there. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm wondering when the Chiefs are invited to the White House, does the White House intend to also invite Taylor Swift? That's going to be up to the uh, to the Chiefs and uh, obviously their decision uh, to figure out who's going to come with them when they come. Uh, and as you know, it's a White House tradition. I can't I can't speak to attendance and who will be here, uh, but we look forward. We look forward to having them here, and obviously we congratulate them on a on a great win. Get Annie. Thanks so much. Um, you talked a lot about how. Um, uh, and the president says this too, that people should watch him when there are yeah. questions about his age. Um, and then, and the issue seems to be that they are watching him in public events, in, in this, some press conferences, and are, are coming to this conclusion, many of them, that he's, he's too old. So what I'm wondering is, is he behaving differently behind closed doors? Because we don't get to see that at all. And are you, do you see, and when you interact with him privately, is there kind of a different, sort of a level of vigor that is perhaps you know, not as visible when we're all seeing him. Publicly. So like, let me just first say, and I was on the swing with him recently, right? He went to Wisconsin, he went to Michigan, he went to California, he went to Vegas, uh, and he's gonna go to Ohio later this week. And so he visited small businesses and he met with uh, people uh, on the road, obviously, and spent hours with them. So folks have seen him and you all have seen him yourselves as you cover this president. Uh, and so you see him interact, you see him engage. And even when he was in Vegas, he took some questions 
questions that you all had, uh, and that I, you know, and and answer. He tends to answer them in in a in a light way, a funny way, uh, and is sharp with his answers to some of you about that. And so look, and he's also meeting with world leaders. He did that with the German Chancellor. He's obviously going to do this uh, today with uh, Kim Abdullah. And I spoke already about my experience with him. And just to answer your question, I have spent countless hours with this president, whether in the Oval Office uh, or uh, on the road. And I have to say, he's sharp. He's engaged. He pushes us for information. Emails at like two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> or you know, is there any sort of? Like, I mean, look, I think. Like a finer point on what it is exactly that like you see that somehow isn't you know coming across to the rest of the American people. Look, I think the fact that when he meets with his t his team, when he meets with staff, uh, he is as I said incredibly engaged, uh, as I said very sharp, and ask us back and forth. We go back and forth on whatever inf information, whatever is is maybe the news of the day that's on that's uh, that's on his mind, uh, and it happens very often, yeah. and so. That's my experience with him. But you all see him on the road. I mean, you know, he was, uh, when we were in Vegas, he was asked about, uh, you know, about, uh, he was asked a specific question about um, uh, the former president. And he answered that in a, in a fun, sharp, you know, kind of way. And, and that's him. That is him. What you see there is him. And so, look, uh, I think. And I do want to step back for a second because I think what's so very important too is this president's record in the last three years and what he's been able to get done. And that matters. And that matters. And so, yes, we're going to continue to be out there. Uh, the president's going to continue to do everything that he can to speak directly to the American people. And we believe that is what's important here. Getting that work done, continuing to move forward in an in a, in a impressive um, record of the, in the last three years, especially for any modern president, uh, whether it's dealing with infrastructure, whether it's dealing with uh, beating big pharma, uh, whether it's getting the econ economy back on its feet, all of these things are important. Let's not forget what's going on outside of this country, what's right? going on in Ukraine, what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, this is something that the president has been able to do in a pretty effective way. And then just to follow up quickly on Matt's question, yeah. um, when um, Super Bowl teams are invited to the White House, do they typically have a plus one? <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. I, uh, I can't answer that uh, right now. But look, we, we are looking forward to having them here. Uh, the Chiefs, and they, uh, it was a, it was a great, it was a great, uh, a, a great win, and just like we do in every, uh, every this is a White House tradition to have uh, the su the winners of the Super Bowl here, and uh, so we're looking forward to it. Okay, I haven't called on you yet. Okay. Is the White House doing anything to move uh, the stalled child and business tax bill in the Senate? Say that one more time. Is the White House doing anything to move forward the stalled child and business tax bill in the Senate? So, as you know, uh, the pr the president supports that bipartisan uh, bipartisan legislation. We've talked about it uh, in here before. Uh, there's always conversations that we're having with congressional uh, leadership and staff on important, uh, obviously important pieces of legislation that matters to the American people. Uh, I don't have anything to read out, uh, but obviously we're in support of that particular legislation. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, shrinkflation and the president's video um, from this weekend in inflation. So, I uh, think by the way. The, um, yeah, sure. the president is, is blaming companies again now, it seems, for inflation. And based on his policies, though, does the president accept any responsibility for where prices are since he came into office? So, a couple of things. Look, uh, we understand how grocery, uh, how grocery prices are a major concern for hardworking families. We get it. We get that, that, that there are, uh, st the prices are still, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of hurting uh, Americans. But what we've seen is that prices have gone down for eggs, for milk, uh, for seafood. And that's important. They've, they're lower than they were a year ago. And we know that's not enough. And so what we, the president, has continue, continuously done, and you see this in this video that you're speaking of, he's called on large corporations to pass their savings onto hard, uh, hardworking Americans. That's what we're doing. And I think that's important that this pre president sees that. And then in shrinkflation, for, so, for folks who are watching doesn't quite know what that is, what we're seeing is the size of a product gets smaller even as the prices stays the same. And that shouldn't be. And so the president's going to call that, and it's uh, you know, and what you're you're seeing it's giving families less of less for their bang, uh, for their buck if you think about that. And so the president has said, and I quote, he's tired of being he's tired of seeing the American people uh, being played for suckers, and that is something he's not going to allow. Uh, but as it relates to um, 
as it relates to what the president's going to continue to do, he's going to continue to lower, uh, do everything that he can to lower costs for the American people, and you've seen him do that. And on, on his uh, doctor, when can we talk to the president's doctor, and how come he hasn't been, or they haven't been asked to come out here and talk with us, given the, the her report that challenges the president's mental fitness? So look, uh, you know, just to speak to uh, the her report really, really quickly. Uh, Special Counsel Her is, is, as far as I remember, is a is a uh, obviously a re a Republican, a a a, uh, a prosecutor. He's not a, he's not a medical doctor. He's just not. It's not for him to speak to. It's just not. And uh, and you've heard from uh, over over the past couple of days since the report has been out, uh, you've heard from legal experts from across the ideological spectrum, even uh, in a former attorney general, and he says, and they have come out to say that the stuff in this report uh, that is capturing all of your attention right now is just wrong, is flatly wrong, it is inappropriate, it is gratuitous, and so going to leave that there, and it is uh, obviously up for uh, a medical doctor to decide on that. But look, I have said the, pres the, the medical doctor, the, the president's doctor is going to do a physical. He's going to, and he has always put forth in the last two years a detailed, uh, detailed memo on the president's, uh, on the president's uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 medical uh, physical, and so I'm just going to leave it there. I don't have anything else to add. Go ahead, Jerry. Curious uh, to sort of follow up and, and get some clarity. If these transcripts were released, who makes that? Is, is that the council's office? Is I don't have anything else to share. That's something that the councils could speak to. They've been uh, answering those questions for the past couple of days. They have to speak to that. Has President Biden expressed a desire to have the full have transcripts talk, released? You have to speak to the council. They've been answering these questions for the past couple of days of incoming on these particular on this particular question on the transcript. They have to speak to that. I get it, Brian. Uh, thanks a lot. As you know, at the beginning of March, the funding for the government runs out. What's the president been doing to avoid a government shutdown and um, make sure that the uh, funding is going to be there at the beginning of March to fund important programs like WIC and the SNAP? Yeah, the president thinks that those programs should be funded. The president thinks that Congress should do their jobs and do the basic part of their jobs and fund that, fund these incredible, incredibly important programs that the American family uh, uh, believe in or need just to survive. And so that's what the president wants to see Congress get to it, do their job, and make sure that the government does not shut down. He did his job. The president did his job a couple months ago, back in the spring of actually last year, not even a couple of months ago, and brokered a deal, brokered a deal with Congress, both the House and the Senate, uh, to get a bipartisan deal forward to make sure that this is during the deficit, remember, uh, and, uh, and the debt ceiling. And so he brokered that deal. It became law because two-thirds of the House, Republicans voted for it. It got a bipartisan support in the Senate. And that was the deal that he brokered. Now Congress needs to get there to get this done. Has he designated a negotiating team that he wants involved I in the mean, White he, House? I mean, we that? negotiated on this, Brian. We did. We negotiated on this. Two-thirds of House Republicans voted for it, a bipartisan support from the Senate. And Congress should do their basic job, which is keep, uh, keep keep the government open and make sure these very important uh, important uh, programs that you just listed out gets funded. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.